Education. Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Travis. I am from Fitness Education Online, one of the founders of Fitness Education Online. Um, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we're, we're big in, in outdoor fitness and boot camp and social media and marketing and a whole range of things these days. Uh, and one of my passions has been kettlebell training. Um, and essentially, I got my first set of kettlebells about 15 years ago. Um, and I've been playing with them ever since. They were like a nice grungy old set of uh, cast iron kettlebells. Back then, there, there weren't many options available. Uh, you couldn't just go to Kmart and buy a kettlebell. And, and to be honest, you couldn't go into Rebel and buy a kettlebell at that point. It was, uh, you know, like pretty um, pretty unique uh, fitness stores that would have them. And, and even getting the kettlebells was, was, wasn't... Uh, wasn't easy back then either. So probably about 15 years ago. I've been playing around with them ever since and, and learning and studying and, and reading. And yeah, there's so much information out there, guys. I highly recommend if you, if you haven't and you love kettlebells, people like Pavel and Steve Cotter and um, there's Mike Ma and um, Steve Maxwell. All these guys are great names. Um, and there's tons of people. Eric Glacier, I like what he does as well. He is Primal Swolger, I believe he's, he's in Monica. Um, I love what he does as well. He animal flow and kettlebells, love that sort of stuff as well. Um, but anyway, what we're going to be talking about today is kettlebells for fitness professionals. And we've got a whole wide range of abilities in here. So I'm really hoping I can cater a little bit for everybody and, and give everybody a couple of nuggets of gold. Um, so since I started playing around with kettlebells and since I've, we're, we're now with Fitness Education Online, we've been around for about six years or since two, four, 2014, so I suppose seven years now. Um, as a sole online uh, education provider. Um, in this time, I've helped plenty of students uh, master the basics of kettlebell trainings for boot camp students. Now, when we say basics, I'm going to outline why I sort of focus on the word basics there, uh, especially when we refer to boot camp. Then I've also helped plenty of one on one clients help learn more of the advanced techniques or the more advanced movements when it comes to kettlebells. Also gone on to write two internationally approved kettlebell courses, uh, approved here with Fitness Australia as well today, which is why I'm here talking to you now. Uh, and I've taught through that hundreds of trainers through whether we've done uh, the online certifications, whether we've done our workshops um, and we've done little coaching seminars and stuff like that. I've gone on to help plenty of trainers learn how to use kettlebells and learn how to implement them into their, into their programs and, and what they offer as well into a few different um, variations. In this time, what I've learned are a couple of key things. The first thing is some clients don't want to touch kettlebells because they've got a fear of them. Fear of getting injured, fear of they're so heavy, fear of like a, this cannonball object they're going to be swinging around. It's not a, you know, not, not like a safe cable machine. You know, this can come from a bad experience that they've had personally. You know, they've you know, gone into some group fitness class and all right, we're doing swings or whatever it might be and had a bit of a bad experience. It could be from a bad experience, a friend that they've had, uh, that, that has had. So it could just be, hey, well, I used kettlebells and, and I hurt my back or one of these things, right? Um, it could be a bad experience from a trainer or a, or a class that they've done. You know, like it, it maybe they've worked with a trainer who hasn't quite had the fundamental knowledge that they need to have. Or maybe they, you know, gone to a class and it's like, Hey guys, we're going to start. We're going to kick off. We're going to do this, and there's not a lot of coaching, and it's everyone's at their own um, at their own devices, just going. All right. If they've developed some bad techniques, and it's come from a trainer or from a class, these ingrained techniques can be a bit harder to to break those bad habits. All right. So uh, quite often, when I've worked with some people, they've already done. Oh yeah, I've done. I've used kettlebells before. I had a trainer at the gym, and you know, and they've got a few techniques that are that are probably iffy at best. Um, generally, the other thing I've learned is that clients are much stronger than they think. The amount of times I've handed them an eight kilo kettlebell and they've gone, oh my God, that's way too heavy. Eight kilos, I can't lift eight kilos. I lift two kilo dumbbells. How am I going to lift eight kilos? Have you got anything lighter? You know, I've heard this plenty of times and I can guarantee 95% of the people I've worked with can lift an eight kilo kettlebell in one way, shape or form. Um, using kettlebell-based exercises as well. Then the next thing is, which is really important, when the right environment is fostered, the challenge of learning new skills is really invaluable for confidence and resilience for the client, right? Which helps them achieve better results. The reason because 
they get confidence in you. They, they learn to trust you and your teaching because you've, you've taught them this new skill that they couldn't do before, right? So they get um, that confidence to learn and to push themselves outside their boundaries. And we know as trainers, what we really need to be doing is pushing people outside of their boundaries to get better results. You know, if, if people just stay inside their boundaries and stay inside their safety comfort zone, their results are going to stagnate pretty quickly, if not, you know, not going to get them at all. So that confidence from learning new skills is vital. And that resilience from going, you know, like, well, I couldn't do this before, but now I can is also super important as well. Anyone feeling me with any of these things so far? Anyone who's been working with trainers or working with clients uh, and heard any of these things, throw it in the chat box um, if any of these are resonating with you. The last thing or the, the last thing I want to leave it with is clients trust you. As a trainer, they trust you as the professional, all right? You're the professional in a relationship. So please don't take that lightly, all right? So they'll trust you whether you know what you're doing or not, all right? And I say that uh, with all due respect to everyone out there, but um, there are people that have trainers and, and don't aren't familiar with certain movements or certain exercises. That's not exclusive to kettlebells either, you know? Like I couldn't teach a yoga class, all right? I don't have the experience to teach a yoga class. So it's not exclusive to something like kettlebells, there's plenty of things in there that are not within our wheelhouse. And, you know, sometimes we, we you know, try and teach some of these things and they're not you know, within our wheelhouse. But realistically, it's much better to know what you're doing, all right? So clients will trust you, even if you don't know what you're doing, but it is much better to know what you're doing. So we have plenty of stuff to cover here today, all right? So the first thing, let me just have a look in the chat box for a quick second. All right, so the first thing we're looking at is why and who should use kettlebells. We've got uh, what kettlebells you should be buying and what sort of weight and what sort of style because there are plenty of options, okay? Programming for individuals and groups. Uh, swing tips that are going to solve a majority of your clients' problems. All right, and then why it's important to do a course as well. All right. Everyone's still got me loud and clear. We've got Melanie who's just saying the connection is dropping a little bit. Uh, everyone's got me loud and clear here. Yeah, beautiful. Oh, great. Sorry, uh, sorry, Mel. It might be on your end. Um, so before we jump in, I'm going to share a quick link in the chat. Um, we're going to be going through, obviously a lot of this is theory-based, uh, but we're going to be going through some little practical tips that you can, you can use for teaching the swings specifically. Um, and if you want to jump in, you can follow this link and get uh, access to our little mini course that we've got around that as well. Not CCs, this is just a little mini course around that as well. All right, that's the link. So if you're watching on the replay, uh, you can go to that link as well, but it's in the chat box there. Uh, on top of that, if you're not familiar with who we are, like I mentioned at the beginning, Fitness Education Online, we've got a very big um, uh, Facebook community group, about 14,000 trainers in there. So if you jump onto Facebook and look up Fitness Education Online Community Group, request to join, say you're in the webinar today. Um, we're all there supporting each other and lots of stuff. We try and help each other out and, and give lots of practical advice and workouts. All things, marketing, kettlebells, workouts, you name it, right? Um, not exclusive to anything. So why kettlebells and who are they for? Short answer is everyone. Everyone can use kettlebells and everyone can benefit from kettlebells. Uh, when we look at athletes, um, the reason why athletes are great, it's great for athletes, is that repeated explosive effort of, better, of, of kettlebells is really valuable. So things like golf, tennis, martial arts, uh, any of the football codes, any of these sports are just ideal. Kettlebells are just absolutely ideal because it's about creating power. Uh, it's about using your hips. Most of this stuff around hips rotational strength, all of that stuff can be taught and done by kettlebells. General population, strength goals. Someone wants to get, to get a little bit stronger, perfect. Someone wants to get a bit more aesthetic or you know, lose a bit of fat, perfect. Someone wants to get a bit more uh, cardio fitness, but maybe don't like running or maybe their joints are no good or whatever it might be, perfect. Kettlebells can solve all of those uh, problems. Prehab activities as well. Um, weaknesses, imbalances, stuff like that. Kettlebells have a, um, a great ability in finding some of this stuff and helping solve it. So the reason I find, uh, in my opinion, that they are a really an ideal tool, like I mentioned, is the repeated ballistic nature of the movements. 
So we're really trying to be explosive. We're trying to be really powerful with a lot of the kettlebell movements, which uh, transfers really well to many sports. You know, like I mentioned, golf tennis, you know, that repeated activity of trying to hit the ball, you're trying to create as much power as possible, maybe not as much power as possible, but, you know, you're trying to create a lot of force when you hit those balls. Um, martial arts, same thing, bracing. So with martial arts, bracing for a punch, bracing for any of those things. So with kettlebells, you brace, explode, brace, explode. Uh, so all of this sort of stuff is really great. It's a lower load. So if you're in the gym, used to lifting with a barbell, maybe you're regularly squatting with 100 kilos or whatever it might be, 150 kilos, whatever you're using on a barbell, right? You can really get the same challenging load from 224 kilos. I find a barbell back squat, you know, let's say you can do a barbell back squat. If you go to a front squat, you can almost never front squat the same as what you can back squat. And it seems just as hard, if not harder. Same thing with the kettlebells. So if you go from the front squat with a barbell to a double front squat with kettlebells, same thing. It's a lot lower weight, but it seems just as hard, if not harder. All right. But so it's less, less taxing on the system. Uh, plenty of posterior chain based movements as well. Uh, finds weaknesses and balances, you know, especially if you use, say, a bottoms up kettlebell where you're holding the bell upside down. A lot of stabilizers, a lot of stuff like that there. Um, and the last thing is that multi planner stuff. So you can work not just in that sagittal plane, you're working, uh, you can work rotation, you can work anti rotation, all of that good stuff as well. Not just all in my opinion either, a lot of this is backed by science. Um, so science in the studies, improved muscular endurance, improved maximal strength, maximal power, power uh, increase aerobic capacity, increase VO2 max, uh, also um, taxing both aerobic and anaerobic systems. As you can see, that's a, a different study, so more evidence to back it up again. Uh, 20 minutes of continuous kettlebell snatches is equivalent to running 20 minutes at a six minute mile pace, which is approximately four minutes per kilometer. So you're, you're, you're going pretty quick. Um, and in that same study, that equated to burning about 20 calories per minute, uh, which I think is only outdone by cross-country skiing off the top of my head. Apparently cross-country skiing burns a lot of calories. But uh, yeah, kettlebells is also a very big calorie burner. So as we move on now to what kettlebells should you buy? All right, let's have a quick look. Yeah, so a few people saying great for, you know, like uh, get-ups are great for judo, perfect. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, plenty of options on the market when it comes to kettlebells. You can buy them from fitness, fitness speciality shops, Aldi, Kmart, Big W, uh, Rebel, you know, sports shops now. You can get kettlebells more or less anywhere. And the common questions I get which kettlebell should I buy? Should I just get the cheapest? Is there any difference between them? And what weights should I buy? All right, so which of the, both of these questions I'm hoping to give you a bit of an answer to right now. So a few of the key types of kettlebells. The first one we're looking at are vinyl or plastic kettlebells. Uh, both options sort of their variations of there on the left. Pros, cheapest on the market typically, All right? These are typically pretty cheap. These are what you're gonna get through Aldi, Big W, Kmart, a lot of those places. Um, maybe potentially a bit of ergonomical design, especially with the uh, the red one down here, which maybe I've never actually used one, but maybe it's less pressure on your wrist. But is it really a kettlebell then? Um, small weight increments. So we, we talk about this a little bit later um, when it comes to using kettlebells, that the, the weight increments are quite large. Um, but with some of these options, they quite often come in like, you know, smaller weight increments. In regards to cons, the biggest and the most, um, the biggest con is essentially the inconsistent size of the bell or the handle. So the bell itself changes size depending on the weight. Um, you know, like these are obviously not to scale here, um, but you know, you might have a bell that's this big and you might have a bell that's this big. And on top of that, the handle changes size and changes shape. So it could be thickness, could be width, all of that sort of stuff, which does play an issue, which we'll chat about later on as well. Uh, the other thing I found with these plastic ones, quite often they have a seam running through the middle of the handle here. I don't know if that's just on this image, but you can sort of see the white thing here, that could be the seam. And that seam is uh, not very nice on your hands, especially if you're doing movements where the bell is rotating in your hand, which should be in most of the movements. So the next option are cast iron kettlebells. 
Um, these were my first set of kettlebells were cast iron. They uh, from four kilos through to twenty kilos. The pros they were pretty cheap and affordable. They're more expensive than the other ones typically. Uh, they're super durable. They go forever. Um, you know, you don't need to worry too much about you know, rust or anything like that or chipping. I mean, they're just hard work tools, right? Um, some of these are very good for two-hand swings. So kettlebells, um, the, the competition kettlebells that you'll see in a second are not actually made for two-hand movements. Uh, they're all made for single-hand movements. Uh, so some of these cast iron bells are a bit better when it comes to two-hand swings. Um, cons, same thing as before, the inconsistent size. Uh, again, you can see here, uh, is that an eight kilo? I think I might say an eight, that might say it's a 16. They're completely different sizes. Uh, even if you bought the same brand, you know, the handles might be completely different thicknesses, completely different shapes. You can see this handle has a bit more curved. This one's a lot more straighter. Um, maybe if you buy from the same brand, at least, you don't get the same handles. Um, but the bell size is also going to be dramatically different. Now, the third option uh, is essentially the competition or pro grade kettlebells, which is the, the one on my on the left of the screen, which would be my right, I suppose. Um, but the left on the screen, the blue one, the pros with that is the consistent handle and the consistent bell size. Now, this is super important whenever you're in that sort of rack position or wherever that bell is basically behind the wrist, uh, which is a lot of movements, especially if you want to learn how to use kettlebells properly. Um, the reason that's so important is as you learn new move, as you go up in weight, let's say you go from a 12 kilo to a 16 kilo to a 20 kilo, your technique remains identical. All you need to do is factor in for that weight change. Everything in your technique stays the same. There's no reason to alter your technique because the handle's consistent, the bell's consistent, always on the same size. The bell on my, on the, the cast iron bell there, which would be on my left as I'm standing looking at the screen, those are the same weights. Those two bells are the same weights. And as you can see, there's a dramatic difference in the size of those bells. And that makes a difference, like I said, when you're learning techniques is you need to adjust and, and cater for the fact that the bell is always a different size. So realistically, if you really wanna learn and focus on kettlebells and learning the art of using kettlebells, I would 100% say buy competition or pro grade kettlebells, okay? Boot camps, you can probably get away with the um, the cast iron kettlebells a little bit more, but we'll talk about that through the programming bit as well. Uh, they're super durable. They're easy to identify. Usually they are colored based on weights and stuff like that. And then uh, cons, they cost more. These are, they are more expensive, but it's not like exuberantly more expensive. All right, they're, they're just a bit more. Um, definitely worth the investment, you know. Um, if I had my time again, I would have just bought the, uh, the, the pro grade bells or the competition bells from the beginning. I've now got a full set of them and, and yeah, so there's, yeah, I, I love those and they're durable and, and they work wonders as well. Um, a con on that is uh, they, there are more increments around now, having said that, but typically the weight increments are in four kilo increments. And so we'll outline uh, some of those features, I believe in the next slide. Um, and some people don't like them for two hand swings. Like I mentioned, they're not actually designed for two hand movements. Okay, so two hand swings, that's not what they're for. They're for single hand movements. Okay, so um, yeah, and, and also competition bells shouldn't vary too much brand to brand. Like it should be fairly consistent brand to brand. Um, but obviously there will be little subtle differences brand to brand. Now, when it comes to what weight should you buy? All right. Um, now, one of the limitations with most bells are the weight jumps. Like I mentioned, they do go in four kilo increments, generally speaking, which is really a massive difference when you break it down. If you're using an eight kilo kettlebell and you're going to move on to use a 12 kilo kettlebell, that's a 50% increase in the weight that you're using. Similarly, from the 12 kilo to a 16 kilo, 33% increase, and then 16 to a 20 kilo represents a 25% increase. So that's like going, you know, like I'm doing... Um, with uh, a barbell, I'm going on, you know, whatever, 40 kilo, 40 kilo bench press, 40 kilo overhead press, whatever it is. And then my next potential weight up is 80 kilos. It's 50% heavier. It's a dramatic difference. It's a big difference. But you can get around that through different types of programming, okay? Uh, so you can get around this through your programming techniques, all right? Um, but that is one of the drawbacks with using kettlebells. Now, what I recommend is this table below more or less, okay? 
Um, so if you've got like on the left-hand side, experience level, um, middle, what weights, and generally what, what weights they will use through different movements. So a female beginner, typically I'd start them with eight kilos. Um, so what I would classify as a female beginner is someone who hasn't had much weight training in general, all right? So, you, you know, like it's sort of beginner, beginner in fitness, okay? Um, they would use from eight through to about 16. So you might be able to get them to do 16 kilo goblet squats, for example. Um, they'll, they'll probably find it heavy, but I guarantee most of them will be able to do it. 16 kilo carries, they could definitely do that as well. Uh, again, they'll find it heavy, but I guarantee they can do it. Uh, intermediate to advanced. Again, I don't mean, uh, I mean that in like lifting experience as opposed to kettlebell experience. I'm talking lifting experience. So they're already squatting, they're already deadlifting, they're already, you know, they've got a bit of experience there. I would start with a 12 kilo bell, typically speaking. And again, same sort of thing. You might work them from 12 through to 16 and 20, all right? Male beginner, typically going to be able to start them with a 12 kilo bell. Um, and again, 12, 16 and 20. And then an intermediate to advanced uh, trainer from 16 kilos starting weight through to 24 kilos when you're, when you're getting some work done there. Um, let's just have a look. So a few questions, just I just see in the chat, what about wire bells? Wire bells are a completely different thing. They're not kettlebells, they're more like a dumbbell. Yeah, you can do some things, but they're, they're different. Uh, where the weight sits is different. So it's it's a different thing. 100% um, suitable for seniors. Yep, exactly. Uh, comes down to programming, perfect. Um, need for multiple weight, uh, that would depend on what you're running. So Shane, um, yeah, perfect. All right, so moving on. Now this table, is just a guide, all right? There are always plenty of outliers. And the more you, you know, all of you guys who are here today are learning and studying and trying to um, progress in your knowledge. And what you learn is you, the more you learn is the more, like the less you know, or, or the less confident you become in your own skills, right? Um, this is a Russian 60 kilo champion at Giveaway Sport, Kasanya Dejankina. Any Russians in the group, I apologize for my terrible pronunciation. But she does uh, kettlebell sport, 10 minutes of snatches. So swing up all the way to overhead uh, with a 24 kilo. And you can only swap hands once in 10 minutes. So you can't put the bell down. And she does 204 of them in under 10 minutes, which I can tell you is completely insane. Um, I would be lucky to do 50. <laughs> you know, it's, it's completely insane. And the blokes uh, use a 32 kilo kettlebell and they're doing 200 plus repetitions as well. So this is a rough guide. There's always going to be outliers. And like I said, the, the more you know, you know, the more you realize there's uh, super freaks out there. Uh, generally speaking though, the table on the other page works uh, perfectly well for general population uh, and even through to advanced sort of trainers as well, generally speaking. If you want more weight, double the kettlebells. Um, and same sort of thing with this table below. A female beginner and a male beginner, I probably wouldn't use double bells with them very much at all early on, obviously. Um, you'd be starting with single bells. Uh, as they're more advanced, if they're more advanced in their lifting experience, you might start using double bells. And you, you'd start with two eights and then probably progressing through to two sixteens for, for females. Um, and blokes, you're looking at two twenty fours. You know, I, I train a lot of guys and um, a lot of them struggle with two twenty fours. That's hard, hard work, uh, whether it be cleans, whether it be squats, whether it be presses. Uh, typically, the only thing that's safe for that is carries. Not safe, but like safe that they do without really any um, that they can do. You know, is carries. Basically, all of them can do carries of twenty fours. Um, but yeah, pressing overhead with twenty fours is it's pretty challenging. Two twenty fours is, is real challenging. All right. So, any questions coming through in regards to uh, what kettlebells to buy, what um, what weights to buy, all of that sort of stuff. So. Um, now we've got a few questions about older members. Look again, it's all relevant, right? So if your older members are super fit and super strong, you can see them using 16 kilos. Like I, I've seen plenty of clients use heavier weights um, as they progress. It all just it's all just based on experience. It's all just based on um, training age as well. You know, like an older. I'm hoping that you know when I'm 70 in 30 years time. 35 years time, I'd still be able to swing around a 30 kilo kettlebell and, and put it overhead and do some of that stuff. Um, perfect. All right, easy. Okay, there we go. In the chat. Um, 
so kettlebells being for one hand, not two hands. Uh, they, just most of the they're they're just historically used as a, as a single hand um, object. So the the two hand swing is is a more modern variation of it. Um, snatches, cleans, Turkish get ups, windmills, bent presses, all of that stuff um, are single hand exercises. So they're predominantly designed as a single hand tool. Um, not that you can't do it with two hand swings and, and goblet squats, right? But, but that's what they're predominantly designed for. Um, so uh, would I buy two of each? Again, we'll talk about some of that when you're programming. So it depends on what you want to do for programming. If you really want to get into kettlebell training, I would recommend, you know, you do one-on-one -on -one stuff, I would recommend two of each size. I would go, uh, if I was buying, I'd go two eights, two twelves, two sixteens. And that's probably going to cater off most of your clients. Um, uh, some other questions. So is buying and using the cheaper kettlebells okay? Well, yeah, of course it's okay, you can. Um, but like I mentioned, if you want to get into learning the art of kettlebell training, whether you want to do cleans and snatches and Turkish get-ups and, and anything in the rack position where or anything with a bell is behind your wrist, I don't recommend using those other ones. They're just not as comfortable. Um, and they're not as consistent. So yeah, so that's from Kaz. Um, but if you're, if you're running group stuff and you're just going to be doing swings and goblet squats, and, and I'll go through some of that in the programming um, and rows and stuff like that, yeah, you, you can use the cheaper ones, no problem. All right. Uh, adjustable kettlebells. I've never used them, so I'd love to. I'd love to hear. Um, I've heard that just there's there's a, there's a great adjustable kettlebell I've seen that I wanted to buy. It goes up to 32 kilos, um, and it's it's in a pro grade capsule, so it's like sits as a pro grade bell. Uh, but I've never actually seen. Uh, I've never used those other weird ones. It, it probably changes it dramatically. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so some in, in between sizes. Perfect. All right. So we'll move on. So. When it comes to programming with kettlebells, it varies on a few factors. Are you trying to learn the art of kettlebells? All right. So are you trying to learn Turkish get-ups? Are you trying to learn snatches? Is it a skill you're trying to develop? Is it something that you're passionate and your clients are passionate about? So how much energy and time are you willing to put into coaching the more complicated movements? Coaching a snatch, coaching a Turkish get-up is very difficult to do in a group setting when it's not focused on kettlebell training because it's a lot of steps and it's a lot of movement. Now I have done it and I do, and I did do it through boot camp. Uh, we did a day though, like we had Tuesday, we had half an hour where they would do kettlebell training for half an hour. And so things we would spend 10 minutes on learning Turkish get up for multiple sessions in a row. We would spend time coaching and learning these movements. So it just depends on whether you want to learn the more complicated movements, all right? Is it for individuals or is it for groups? Again, is it a group that's focused on kettlebell training or is it just a group? You're just training, tr training with group fitness and kettlebells is just going to be a tool that you're using, all right? So it's the same question as above, all right? Is the kettlebell just another tool you're using or is it you really want to learn how to use it like a kettlebell, all right? And it, hey, if you don't want it, that's cool. It doesn't matter, all right? Yeah, whatever, you know. But there are things you should be using it for and it's not just like bicep curls, right? <laughs> um, so one thing I do recommend is even if you've got those other bells, those vinyl bells or whatever, you should at least be swinging them and you should be swinging them properly because you can't do that with many other bits of equipment. You can't do it very well with many other bits of equipment, right? And what are your goals, obviously? You know, are you a power lifter trying to train an elite one rep max? Studies have suggested it can help you, but is it going to make up a, a majority of your training? Probably not, right? So it just depends on what your goals are in training. You want to get a little bit fitter. You want to get a little bit stronger. You want to look a little bit better. Uh, you want to stay outside and don't want to go into a gym. Kettlebells are the perfect tool. Perfect tool. You want to train uh, for an activity or for a sport. Again, kettlebells are a perfect tool. All right. Uh, yeah, that's there. Just answer that. So whatever your answers were to those previous questions, these are some of my general programming principles, okay? I really focus my program to include the seven key movement patterns or the seven primal movement patterns. I'm sure we've all seen or heard of these before. Um, if you haven't, look it up, all right? But it's basically a squat, a lunge, a bend or a hinge, a twist or rotation or anti-rotation I put in there, a pull, a push, and a gait, a walk, a moving variation. So what I try to focus is on my whole program, I want to include all of those elements, okay? 
I want to make sure that I'm including each of those elements regularly and through my program. Is that mean they're going to include them in every single workout? Not necessarily. But I want to try and include each of those through my whole holistic program, okay? Uh, and you want to throw in there uh, multi-planar work, so not just in that sagittal plane as well, which can be done in lots of different ways. That anti-rotation stuff is good for that. Um, gait, gait stuff's good for that as well. And obviously through lunges and all that bends and you can do all sorts of variations there as well. Um, and obviously include plenty of posterior chain exercises, okay? Um, bear with me. Um, just having a look. Yep, perfect. So what exercises are available that suit these when it comes to kettlebells? There are plenty of these are just a short list that I could think of in the top of my head as I was going through it. Uh, when it comes to hinges, any of the deadlift variations of hinges, so RDLs, single RDLs, suitcase carries, double suitcase carries, any of the swing variations are hinges. Two hands, single hand, ski swing, pendulum, they're hinges, most of them are hinges. Any of the snatch variations are gonna be hinges. Any of the clean variations are gonna be hinges. Squats, goblet, goblet squats, rack squats, single squats, overhead squats, um, split squats, you know, single leg squats, step ups, lunges, walking, stationary, overhead, reverse, cossack, cleaner lunge, split lunge, all sorts of stuff, windmills, Turkish get-ups, renegade rows, and any single hand movement is an anti-rotation movement. Pushes, push, uh, push overhead, strict press, push press, jerk, double, um, floor press over that, uh, that way, kneeling, seated, uh, jerks, bent press, all right, all of those movements, bottoms up position, rows, uh, renegade rows, alternating rows, double rows, um, snatches, cleans, they are all sort of pull movements as well. Gates would be carries, um, suitcase carries, farmer carries, waiters carries. So suitcase on one side, farmers on both sides, waiters overhead, uh, rat carry here. And obviously all of those with, with double and then also the mixed. Rack and overhead, rack and suitcase. You know, all of these variations are often bottoms up variations. All those options are, are available in, when it comes to carries as well. So that is a hell of a lot of exercise options that suit those needs, right? Now, what I do is I try to break it down even more simple than that because these are the six movements I would basically focus on, which caters for most of those things instantly, all right? Um, okay. So I would focus on the swing and variations of the clean, the snatch, the press, the squat, and the Turkish get up. All right, they're basically the movements that I focus, I would focus on, especially on an individual level. All right, this is more for individual levels at the moment. I'll talk about groups in a second. All right. Now, what's also important is to understand that the types of exercises are different, and so they will vary for programming uh, purposes. Ballistic movements are quicker to complete. So you can get more reps done in a short of, in a minute, for example. Um, so they're more conditioning based. Uh, you do more volume and you're slower to fatigue on them. All right. So your, your fatigue rate is much slower compared to grinds. So grinds are more strength based movements. They take longer to complete and they're more focused on strength. So swing, ballistic, snatch, ballistic, uh, explosive exercises. A press is a grind, okay? Turkish get up can fit into it, is a grind. Uh, squats, grinds, okay? They are slower movements to complete. Now this table outlines uh, how they work and also roughly how many reps you can do in a minute, right? So with a swing, you can do up to about 40 reps in a minute, okay? Uh, with a clean, depends on weight, obviously, um, but if you would go 40 reps in a minute, you could probably do it, right? Uh, cleans up to about 25, snatches up to about 25 reps. Um, presses, a grind is a bit slow. You're getting about 14 reps in. Um, squat is really going to vary on your weight. So you could get 20 squats in if you're doing, a, I don't know, depends on your strength, right? If you're doing, you know, for me, if I'm doing um, 16 kilos goblet squats, I could get 20 in a minute, I would imagine pretty easy. Uh, but if I'm doing double 24s, there's no way I'm getting 20 of those in, in a minute. I might get I might get eight of them in a minute, right? Um Turkish get-ups, doesn't matter what you do, what weight you're using. If you get four done in a minute with no weight, you're going pretty quick. 
Um, and then, you know, if you've got a big weight, you get two done and then you're still going pretty quick. Um, so it does vary there. Like, so the, the importance of this information is so that when you program something, you know that, you know, like, hey, we, we're, we're doing a circuit and we're doing Turkish get-ups, you know, like you, you, know, you can't expect people to get done eight, eight Turkish get-ups in a minute. So if they're going to be at that station for one minute and they're going to be doing Turkish get-ups for one minute, they might get one rep done if they've not done it. Right, but this is what I talk about when when I say, are you going to spend the time coaching that movement? Because if they're there for one minute, like they're, they're never going to learn that movement. They need a lot more time to learn that movement. All right, they need to be really confident in that movement before you program it in like a circuit. Okay. And conversely, something like a snatch, yeah, you can get twenty of them done in a minute, but again, it's it's a complicated movement. All right. So. Realistically, it is really endless with what you can do, okay? Um, all right. Perfect. Uh, I'll get to that, Richard, a bit later, all right? It's a bit of a different question. Uh, realistically, the programming for it is endless, all right? What I like to do is ladders, EMOMs, AMRAPs, sets and reps. That's sort of the programming style that I really like, especially for individuals as well. It's pretty similar for groups, to be honest. Um, groups, I would do more surface. Um, my preference is usually keeping it pretty minimalistic, so not changing it too much, all right? So not trying to do 20 different movements, just focusing on a couple of key movements. Um, I would do three sessions a week, all right? Um, you know, if you're doing like that programming style, you know, over a four to 10 week period. Um, a great option is like that ABA style. So you've got an A workout and a B workout. Um, and so week one, you do workout A, Workout B, workout A. Week two, you would do workout B, workout A, workout B. That makes sense. So over a two-week period, it's a great programming um, style to use, um, and you you get that that progression that way as well. That's ideal if you're doing PT and you're doing one PT session a week. Kettlebells is an absolutely perfect thing to send people home for home workouts. You know, if you do one PT session a week and send them home with three kettlebell workouts a week to do on the side. That is absolutely gold standard, right? And that you can coach them how to do all those movements. They know how to do all those movements. You just program, here's two workouts that you're going to do three times a week. So you do this one twice a week and this one once a week and then flip it around for the next five weeks or for the next 10 weeks. They're going to get great progression through those workouts, great progression through those movements. Um, when it comes to success with kettlebells, you don't necessarily measure the success on the weight you're using. So I'm using 12, now I'm using 16, now I'm using 24. You don't necessarily measure it so much on that. You more measure it on the amount of volume you're doing. So, you know, that means like total volume. I've done 10 swings with 10 kilos, so that's 100 kilos. Next workout, I do 12 swings with 10 kilos, and now that's 120 kilos. So I've done more volume in that same amount of time or potentially in a longer period, slightly longer period. So it's measured like that. So either through sets and reps or duration, okay? And this is because the kettlebells can't be micro-loaded, okay? So you can't really micro-load a kettlebell to half kilo like you can with a barbell. So you can't just do, all right, do a bench press. This week, it's 40 kilos. Next week, it's going to be 42 kilos. Next week, it's going to be 45 kilos, all right? You can't, it doesn't work like that with kettlebells. Um, you can't just use that linear progression like you would with, with in a gym where you just move the pin down or half a pin, you know? just doesn't work like that. So we use undulating periodization, which is where like one variable is changed. So like I mentioned, you change the amount of reps. So instead of doing, you do five sets of five, next week you do five sets of six or six sets of five, all right? Or, or five sets of four, or sorry, five sets, four sets of five, and then one set of six. So you're just changing that volume, all right? That's how, that's the progression with kettlebells a lot of the time. A real basic example is a 10 week swing program. You're going to do uh, 10 minutes every minute on the minute. Week one, you're going to do 10 swings every minute. Week two, you do 11 swings. Week three, you do 12 swings. And so on and so on until you're getting to 20 swings every minute. Right? You're doing all of a sudden over 10 weeks, you've gone from doing 100 reps in 10 minutes, say 12 kilo or 16 kilo kettlebell. You're now doing 200 reps in 10 minutes. Okay, so you've increased the amount of volume in uh, the same amount of time, right? And then you increase the weight and you repeat, okay? Now, this is what I did. I'm just conscious of time because I've plenty to get through still. 
this is sort of some of the programming I did for myself uh, over COVID. I focused on four key workouts, light training with volume, light double for volume, double bells, like a heavy single bell for strength and heavy double bell for strength, okay? And what I did was I basically had a couple of standard workouts that I would do and I would just change the reps and sets based on whatever weight I was using uh, and about a 30 minute set. So these are the sort of formats that I did. I did one, which was like a 30 minute AMRAP. I did one, which was around volume where I focused on repetitions would be at least 10 repetitions on each exercise um, and potentially up to 25, even up to 50 repetitions or max repetitions. So sometimes I just did max as many as I could do, right? Uh, if I was working for time, it'd be at least a minute and it would be up to 10 minutes without putting the kettlebell down. Strength focused, minimum of three reps typically, uh, maximum of about eight repetitions, three to five sets. Uh, if I was working for time, typically around that 30 second time, uh, but at least equal rest. So for strength stuff, you want sort of at least equal rest. Uh, circuits are just sort of standard stuff. Um, if I used a heavier weight, I would have less work, more rest. A lighter weight, more work, less rest. All right? Hopefully that all makes a bit of sense. So here are some of the workouts that I used in those um, in those particular uh, in those particular workouts. So uh, as an AMRAP variation with a single light kettlebell, I might have done three reps as a ladder. I do three reps, five reps, and seven reps of a clean and jerk. So I do three clean and jerks on one hand, and then I do three squats, and I do three lunges. Then I change hands, and I do three, three, and three. So as you can see there, that's uh, I think that's 18 repetitions without putting the bell down. At the end of that three, that set of three, I do 20 skips, 20 double unders. Then I'd move to the five. So five clean and jerks, five squats, five lunges, change hands, five, 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 20 double unders, then seven, 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 20 double unders, and then I carry the bells, in both hand, uh, one hand, one hand for 100 meters and carried in the other hand for 100 meters. When I came to using the double kettlebell, using the exact same workout format, I do two bells, I do five clean and jerk, five squats, five lunges, 20 double unders. Eight clean and jerks, eight squats, eight lunges, 20 double unders, 10, 10, 10. And then I carry both bells in both hands for 200 meters. All right, so there and back. If I was doing that same workout with a heavy bell, I would do one, two, and three. So I do one clean, one jerk, one squat. And then I'd go change hands, one clean, one jerk, one squat, 20 double unders. As you can see, it's the same workout formula. It's just, I'm changing the weight and therefore how I'm completing it and, and how it challenges me as well. Suitcase carry, 50 meters instead of 100 meters. Same thing with the double kettlebell, uh, three, four, five reps basically. Um, as you can see, what I did differently in the, in the light ones, I did clean and jerk in one movement. With the heavier ones, I split those into two movements. So I did just cleans and then just jerks, all right? And no lunges, because that, that's too taxing with the heavy bell. So it's less, even less. Um, but as you can see, it's the same, very similar workout. It's just using a different bell, changing with the volume, all right? And I just play around with this over time. Uh, when it comes to my volume and strength sort of workouts, When it comes to using uh, yeah, volume strength workouts, one I did was uh, you know like a minute on and then a minute of the passive, which would be a minute of swings and then I hold a plank for a minute. Then I do a minute of press and then I do a side plank for 30 seconds on each side. And a minute of press on the other side, dead bug, minute of gorilla row, so two hand rows, uh, bird dog, goblet squats, right? And I do that for three rounds. When it came to, why is it not progressing? There we go. When it came to like a heavy single bell, I do 30 seconds on one side 30 seconds on the other side, and then planks. 30 seconds on one side, 30 seconds on the other side, then the plank, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Same sort of workout, again, much heavier bell, just a slight variation. Um, and then a couple of other variations I did with the double bells. Obviously you could do those two workouts um, with double bells as well. But the other one with the double bells, I did a uh, e, e mom, so every minute on the minute, but I did over a three minute period. So E3, so every three minutes, um, I did five rounds. And I didn't put the bell down between exercises. So each round, I went through all the movements without putting the bell down. So I do five swings, five cleans, five squats, five presses, five half snatches. So snatch, bring it down to here, and then go again. Snap, bring it down to here. Okay. For me, the goal on that was to increase the amount of repetitions. So I started at that. So then the next time I would do it, I would try and do five sets of six. 
and then five sets of seven in the same time frame in three minutes. So it becomes more and more challenging. Then the same sort of variation for the heavy double bells. This time I would spend 90 seconds on each movement. So I do five single leg RDLs in 90 seconds and wait. Now I do five squats in 90 seconds and wait. Then five split squats and then five renegade rows. And again, the goal here would be to either increase the repetitions. So maybe I get to six repetitions or maybe instead of giving myself 90 seconds, I give myself 80 seconds. So I'm just changing my system a little bit, right? A little complicated, but hopefully that makes sense. Does that make a little bit of sense for everyone in the chat there? Uh, yeah, so perfect. Yeah, great. Okay, glad. I'm glad that all makes sense for you. Uh, what does AMRAP stand for? AMRAP stands for as many reps as possible or as many rounds as possible. And yes, you can get the slide deck as well afterwards. Um, great. Okay. So when it comes to groups, it is a little bit different. So um, I treat this as non-specific group training. So one bell between at least three to five people. I sit with the same styles. Uh, I focus more on pure on conditioning than strength. Now with the exercises I focus on for groups will be deadlifts, swings, carries, squats, rows, lunges. Why? They're the quickest and easiest to teach. They're simple uh, to provide harder variations and there's plenty of posterior chain movements, okay? And then on top of that, as you see, I'm avoiding things like clean snatches, Turkish get-ups, windmills, and the rack position in general. Um, in groups, it's just easier. Like if they're not focused on learning kettlebells and it's just a tool, it's much easier to focus on those things, all right? In, in my opinion, in my opinion. Um, now, if you download the mini course that I shared with you in the video, it's gonna give you a lot of this stuff. So I'm gonna really brush through really quickly on this because I've got uh, about five minutes before we need to wind up. So first one is developing a hinge. You need to develop the hinge with clients. So you can do that with a broomstick technique, keeping points of contact, all right? You see, or to the wall like this. The key with the two of the wall is you don't want to fall back on the wall and you don't want to have your arms out in front as a counterbalance. So as you can see here, I'm mimicking a swing. If you do this, you'll find it's impossible to do this without having a neutral spine. Uh, it's a great one. This one's an absolutely great one. Impossible to do without a neutral spine. Uh, and then you do the RDL, all right? Uh, next thing you want to do is make sure clients are not over squatting. So what I like to do is use a bottle, a kettlebell, um, a witch's hat, and if they over squat, they hit it. And so they very much, very quickly correct the over squatting. As you can see, not much bend in my knees there, okay? Um, kettlebells are obviously a much bigger bang. Um, bottles and, and witch's hats are really good there as well. The other good one is a using... Um, the, the band around the waist, this forces you to really use your hips, all right? Forces you to really concentrate on getting explosive through the hips. Uh, you can do it with deadlifts or swings. Uh, this band's probably too heavy because I'm sort of leaning into it a bit too much. Uh, so a lighter band would probably be a bit better there. Now, when it comes to programming for groups, uh, this is a variation that you can do for one bell between three people. So uh, I like this one. I'd put a 20 second timer and I put it for 27 rounds, okay, in total. Which is nine, which is nine blocks, nine minutes. I'm going to focus on unilateral exercise and bilateral exercise. All right. So if it's a unilateral exercise, you do 20 seconds on one side, 20 seconds on the other side. If it's a bilateral exercise, you're just doing 40 seconds straight, and then you get 20 seconds rest. All right. As you're coaching this, I would only explain it as a block like this. So if you've got 30 people, you need 10 kettlebells, 10 bands. Okay, which is pretty manageable for 30 people. All right. So the first exercise would be, all right, guys, if you have the kettlebells, you're doing swings on the left hand for, for the first 20 seconds. The bell will go and you're doing swings on the right hand for the next 20 seconds. And then you get 20 seconds rest, all right? And you do that three times. If you're on the band, you've got rows for 40 seconds. If you're on the bodyweight exercise, you've got bear crawls for 40 seconds, all right? You can go, you know, change stations. So you go from swings to rows to bear crawls, back to swings, back to rows, back to bear crawls. Or you can stay at the same station for three rounds, all right? Next one, goblet squats, so bilateral, 40 seconds, pallet press, uh, unilateral. So you do 20 on one side, 20 on the other side, into push-ups. Bend over rows, unilateral, right? So 20 on one side, 20 on the other side. Um, bands, extensions, or pull downs, whatever you want, um, and then sit outs. If you, if you need more stations, add a station. Add a bodyweight strength, bodyweight cardio, all right? And then you do 12-minute blocks. And that way you need one bell between four people. 
all right? Um, and if you want a longer workout, do an extra block, all right? The advantage of this is you only need to explain three exercises at one time. So if you're doing a circuit, rather than explaining nine exercises in a circuit, we go, okay, you're doing this, then 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 this, and they're like, sorry, what am I doing? You're just explaining three at a time. I love doing circuits this, circuits this way. I never do more than five exercises in a circuit. Never, never, never. All right? Five exercises in a circuit, and I might do that one for 20 minutes, and then I'll do another circuit for 20 minutes with five new exercises. Way better, way more efficient to run. Okay? Um, yeah, my complete favorite. Um, hopefully that all made sense. Really rushed through it um, really quickly. What weight do I recommend for beginners? Uh, I said at the beginning, um, so go back at the beginning of the presentation on the replay. Now, why is it important to do further training with kettlebells? First key reason is your insurance coverage. Second one is just because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean you can coach someone to do it. Just because you can do a swing doesn't mean you can coach someone to do a swing, all right? It is a very different skill, okay? And you don't want to look like any of these guys. Now, I love Joe Rogan. Uh, one of my favorite guys to listen to. Uh, great for some fitness knowledge, but his kettlebell technique is rubbish. <laughs> All right. That is a recipe for disaster. Bad wrist, bad elbow, bad shoulders. He's using a big heavy weight. Uh, and I know he's had elbow issues. And I know he's had shoulder issues. Next bloke, CrossFit style. Nothing too wrong with that, but having those hands together like this, and that is actually very challenging for a lot of people, uh, mobility wise. CrossFit do it basically for um, the purpose of consistency. This bloke, Mr. V Shred um, on YouTube, again, similar to Joe's, but even worse, uh, problems waiting to happen. And Jillian Michaels uh, from Biggest Loser fame of the beginning series, teaching a group on like a TV program. I could not believe this one when I watched it, uh, how to do kettlebell swings. And she was coaching and prompting them to do kettlebell swings that look like this. Uh, this lady here is doing a better swing than Jillian Michaels, and she's probably only doing it so bad because of the cueing that Jillian Michaels gave. So... Yeah, learn how to do it so you don't look like these guys. Um, now, we have an online course, obviously, guys. Uh, we do level one. We do a level two, all 100% online. Now, get your all your CECs. It's all work at your own pace. There's a video assessment at the end of each of the course. Uh, normally, each one's $300 or thereabouts. Um, for you guys coming from the webinar today, there's a saving of uh, $147. That'd be $447. Um, I'm going to go into the chat box. I'm going to throw a link in the chat box if you are interested in uh, doing that. I'll throw that link in the chat box for you and you can go through. Uh, there's both links here. One's for the freebie and then the other one is for the course. So I'll throw them both in the chat box there. And then we've got a couple of minutes. Whoop, sorry, I do that to everybody. Uh, all attendees, I've just sent it to Rachel. There we go. Um, so I've got a couple of minutes left over here where I'll get to as many questions as possible. One of the questions in the chat, which I saw, which has already disappeared, was the difference in like a hang clean and a swing clean. I definitely prefer the swing clean variation. Um, I know actually in this one, I know Joe Rogan is actually doing, um, he's actually doing a alternating hang clean. Um, it's challenging, it's bloody hard. I prefer the swing variation. Um, I just like it much nicer. Um, then we had a couple of questions in the chat box about older adults. Um, look, again, you uh, clients with carpal tunnel, wrist and RSI, you'd have to just make that judgment on, on that client. I mean, arthritis, I would imagine it's fine. Um, wrist, it should be fine for wrist because if you keep a neutral wrist, not if you do stuff that looks like the other guys, um, you just have to make that um Make that judgment with your particular clients, all right? Um, yeah, it's hard to answer that one for you. Um, all right, what, uh, any other questions uh, we've got coming in? I've got, I don't know how quickly we get kicked out, but we've got two minutes. <laughs> so I did rush through that as quick as possible towards the end, so I do apologize. Um, hey, Zoe, how's it going? Um, all right. Uh, oh, sorry. I, I see Rachel. Rachel sent me a message saying we can run over time. Um, it is all good. So any other questions, guys? Insurance a bit more. So uh, that's from Karina. So with insurance, Fitness Australia would be, I'd be talking to them as well. But from my experience with insurance is they refer back to Fitness Australia. So they'll say, have you done some specific training with that equipment? 
um, which qualifies you to use without equipment. Did you do any specific training in your course? Yes or no? Uh, if the answer is no, they may not actually qualify you to work with that bit of equipment. It's the same with cardio boxing. It's the same with a lot of that stuff. Um, so double check with your insurer whether or not you're qualified to use some of these bits of equipment um, because maybe, yeah, maybe you are not, all right? Uh, that's why it would be important to check with that. Um, again, if you've got questions, it's probably best to throw them in the question box as opposed to the chat box because the chat box is going very, very, very quickly, um, which is nice, nice to see. Uh, can you just do the level one? Yes, you can. So in regards to the two courses, we've got level one, level two. Level one is designed for those of you who want to run basically group stuff. Um, so it's basically focused on all the movements that I would teach in a group setting. Level two is focused more on those movements that you would do as an individual. So level one doesn't talk about Turkish get-ups or snatches or double kettlebells or any uh, triplanar stuff. So working across different planes. It focuses on all those movements. It does cleans uh, in level one. Um, but it, it's all those movements that I would, I would really reserve for group training. Um, level two goes into those movements that are more advanced. So yeah, you can only do level one. If you only want to get like those fundamentals, level one is the one to go. If you want to go a little bit further, uh, level two. Um, yeah, perfect. A couple of people, thank you for, for those who've done the courses. I can't see whose name it is. It just says Mish, M-I-C-H. So I can't actually see who that is fully. Um, yeah, perfect. Love it. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback, guys. Really appreciate um, all the positive feedback. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. Those of you who were an eight in regards to your knowledge, hopefully I gave you some stuff there. Uh, let me know if uh, let me know if if I ticked the boxes for you if you if you came in with an eight. So hopefully, hopefully I gave everyone a, a little bit of a bit of knowledge there. I feel like the eight people I probably rushed through the programming stuff, so I apologize. Um, queuing for excessive lumbar arch on the swings. So I'd use the broomstick, I'd use the to the wall technique, and then I would use um, the RDL. So that's from David. Uh, so that's in the short thing that, that I, that I the, the short course that I sort of gave you the, the link for as well. Uh, went over that really quickly, so I apologize. Um, perfect. All right, uh, where do I find the list of our courses? Fitnesseducationonline.com.au um, is probably the easiest way to find uh, our courses. 